Hello gardeners and thank you for watching. We're here with Mid-American Gardener and I have three really talented folks with me. So we're gonna talk about all things plants and find out what you have in mind as well for us. I'm Diane Nolan and I teach horticulture at the University of Illinois in the plant sciences uh, lab in the crop sciences department. So I will handle cut flower questions and perennials and various and sundry landscaping things. But we have three really good panelists. Let's find out who's here. And then you can hear their expertise as well and direct your questions that way. I'm gonna start first and throw it over to you, Doug Williams. Hello, I'm Doug Williams. I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Illinois in the Department of Recreation, Sport and Tourism. My background is in horticulture and landscape design. So I look forward to answering questions about design in particular and also about woody plant care. Mm -hmm. Great. And do you have an email for us? I do. We have one of our emails, and this email is asking about um, tree care. They have a, a large tree that actually has very large roots that are above uh, the ground, which is becoming an obstacle for them to cut when they're trying to mow. And they're asking how can they uh, remedy this situation without um, killing the tree. Uh, more than likely, you probably don't want to cut the roots because that's going to inhibit the canopy's growth. One thing you can do that is pretty immediate and that is mulch. Um, if it's an area, <clears throat> you can uh, find whether it's grass clippings or um, uh, any other type of hardwood bark mulch. You can use some of those different types of things to uh, not have to mow in the region around those roots. And I think that's pretty simple and basic. I see it in a lot of places. Some people do these nice rings around trees, but if it's irregular, that's okay too. Mm -hmm. Because if you have a larger tree, it's probably not perfectly round as far as its root mass. And mulch lets water come through, but soil, don't do the soil. That's, people are mounding that up, not so good. Thank you very much, Doug. And now on to you, Jennifer Nelson. Hi, I'm Jennifer Nelson. I'm a horticulture educator with the University of Illinois Extension, and I brought a fun show and tell today. I brought, this is called a resurrection plant or a resurrection fern. And my husband just brought me this one from a trip he went on, and it just looks like kind of a dead ball of, of plant material. And then I remembered that I had one in my office that was about 10 years old, and it looked like this, and I put it in water yesterday. And see, once it gets water, it starts to unfurl. And this is actually starting to get a little green. It's a slaginella, a type of moss. And it actually grows naturally in New Mexico and in Texas. But it's this is a survival mechanism. It can survive being dried out like 90% of its moisture can be lost and it's still alive. So just something fun you might see when you're out and about shopping this uh, this season and, and maybe in a gift shop or something. It is a real plant. It does Interesting. really does really uh, live. They say it'll grow a little bit of roots if you put it in a pot of soil, but I think it's more fun to just kind of see it miraculously come to life. That is really cute. Kind of an interesting um, conversation piece. How's definitely, that? Definitely. Well, great. Thank you, Jennifer. I like that show and tell. And now next to me, David Robson. Hi, Hi. Diane. Thanks, you. Um, <coughs> I'm David Robson. I also work with Diane in the Department of Crop Sciences here at the University of Illinois. I'm a pesticide specialist as well as a horticultural specialist. Um, I'll try to answer anything as long as it's not flowers, fruits, or vegetables. Um, oh, you so can even do those too. I know I could do those. <laughs> and if they got an insect or disease on them, I usually end up having those. But I do have a flower question. I have a person, has a great last name, or first name named David also, who is buying a house and Closing of that house is in March. There are peonies at that location that they're interested in moving before the closing because after they close, that's not an option. Uh, when is the best time to move them and how do you move them during the winter months? Well, if the ground isn't frozen, it's gonna be a lot easier. If the ground is frozen, you may have to put something warm on top of the ground to actually thaw the ground up. I would recommend digging them up a peony shouldn't be that deep in the ground. It should only be one or two inches, but it may have a good massive root system. If it doesn't thaw out and you're getting that closing approaching and approaching, you just may want to put some warm water on the soil, actually to kind of warm the soil up. I would recommend them uh, put them in pots or keep them in some soil, but as soon as the ground does thaw, keep them in the, uh, in the garage where they're cool so they don't start growing. But as soon as that ground thaws in the spring, put them in the ground. 
they may bloom this year they may start to bloom and the flower may abort but you shouldn't have any problem with the plants I've transplanted peonies in the dead of summer when it was 105 degrees and the darn things died and came up great the next year. So mm -hmm. sort of like daylilies, it's kind of hard to kill them. I mean, you still can, but I would tell you, go ahead, dig them up. As soon as the ground starts thawing, put them in the garage in a pot. Don't put them in plastic where they may start rotting and plant them in as soon as possible in the spring. Okay, very good. Thank you. And next, let's go to our Did You Know segment. Asparagus plants can take up to three years to produce edible stalks. But once the plants start, they can be productive for up to two decades. And possibly more. Oh yeah, because all and of those wild more. ones don't mm -hmm. know the yes. two decades. So yes. that's we're qualifying it, but possibly more. All right, let's go to the phone lines and see what Charles has for us on line two. Something about grass. What's your question, Charles? Hi, I have two dogs, and I'm looking to redo the backyard this spring. Mm -hmm. And what I'm looking for is um, a sturdy grass that's going to be able to hold up with the dogs. Okay, so a turf... Something that they can romp on. All right. I'm looking at you three. Oh, I have an idea. Okay. Oh, no. I'm, I, I'm going to go with the turf-type tall fescues. Okay. I thought you were um, going to say astroturf. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay. The, the turf-type tall fescues. Okay. Uh, tall fescue is a cool season grass. Uh, it's often used as a pasture grass. It's an extremely wide blade grass. Very drought, disease, insect, and wear resistant as far as a grass. Just has a wide blade, but the new turf type ones have a blade about a third of the original width. It's a bunch type grass, so it can withstand a lot of traffic. The downside to a bunch type of grass is that they can thin out, and then on the turf type tall fescues, when they do thin out, the blade starts getting wider and wider. And it can look kind of weedy or kind of clumpy, but if you get them established, a turf-type tall fescue is one of the best wear-resistant grasses, but you also have to follow a regular maintenance program to keep them thick. That's my choice. Okay, good, that's not AstroTurf, <clears throat> okay. All right, well, we're gonna take that and run with it. Thank you, Charles, for your question. And on to line three, and Jerry has a question about avocados. Hi, Jerry. Hi, I wanna know, we got an avocado we got out today. And there's a big seed in there. Okay. I want to know how you plant it, what you plant it in. I'll say it's possible. I had one sprout accidentally in our compost bin, and that mm. was kind of an, uh, I can't explain to you why. Um, it was one of the larger avocados. I have read that those are easier to sprout than, than the smaller ones. Um, this is after we spent a whole lot of time trying all sorts of different ways to sprout them in the office and nothing worked. And then I happened to go in the compost bin at home and said, well, look at this. Do you have to uh, scarify it or file it? or I, This was something I just threw in the compost okay. bin. Okay. And yeah. it, did, it did produce a nice looking plant. Which, Excellent. But um, I, totally by accident. I, there's a lot <laughs> of different ideas out there. Like I said, the larger avocados have a larger seed. Sometimes those are actually sprouting when you open the, the fruit up. It's well worth a try. I've yeah. done the toothpick and yeah. letting yeah. it yeah. sit in. Yeah. And sometimes they work and sometimes mm -hmm. they don't. Mm -hmm. You are out nothing if it does not work. Exactly. Right. But it's extremely interesting if it does work or if right. it doesn't work. Well, and then when you plant them, you don't plant them totally in the ground, right. but like like right. halfway. Halfway, so, yeah. yeah. Some sources okay. say to take that papery coating off the seed, too. Okay. Yeah, my father's grown one, and it's grown a couple of leaves, and that's just about it because it's in Chicago. So <laughs> uh, It doesn't quite. You don't have that much room inside the house <laughs> to yeah. get but your still, fruit. But still, it's fun to get it to that stage. He did, yeah, so. it worked. Yeah. Well, hey, give it a try, Jerry, and you can report back. All right, let's go to Betty's question on line four. And it says here your question is about dirt. Do you mean soil? <laughs> Betty? Yes, thanks for taking my okay. call. Okay. Um, I have really bad soil. Okay. Uh, we had some apple trees here, and uh, one got sick, and we, when we dug it out, when it died, it, the roots were just all wound around. What happens is that we, when we plant something in the ground, we find about an inch of topsoil, 
and then we have this stuff that's better made from pot, <laughs> making pot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And, you know, we may, we dig holes bigger and everything, but, um, and I, I just resorted to raised beds for my garden, but I would like to plant some fruit trees that are going to poke their roots through this clay. And what can I do? I mean, I, I add a lot of black dirt and compost and everything when we plant stuff, when we plant it, make huge holes. But I've got a cherry tree that hasn't grown more than an inch in two okay. years. Mm. Okay. All right. So it's possible some of the topsoil got removed. If there were Especially the, if it's a new subdivision. Yeah. It, that happened in one part where my house was. It took a long time to get nice soil. I think that sounds like a landscaping type of question. <laughs> We're looking at you. You have to move. No, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> that is a good idea. Well, no. no. I think you may have to get it was like bales of peat moss uh, to really incorporate into the soil, uh, which is costly, but I think for the long term and the, the immediate uh, impact you want for those fruit trees. Because um, if you have, like you're saying, clay soil, you don't want to add sand because you're going to get concrete mm -hmm. um, or something pretty close to it. Uh, or you could just uh, maybe sell some of it away for a ceramic, <laughs> right. ceramic slab. And, and trade it for some topsoil but, holding. But I think you're doing the right thing with adding a lot of organic matter. But um, you may want to purchase some uh, large bales of um, peat moss and start to incorporate that over at least a year or so. Now, any kind of comp, I, I know you said compost, but any organic matter need to get the uh, earthworms working. Mm -hmm. And it took about 10 years where they took some soil off the front of my house for, I mean, just adding mulch and, oh. Mm -hmm. uh. Well, then people do but think. Now it's great. People think that organic matter you add only one time and they don't oh, realize no, that. constantly. You ha it, the soil is constantly breaking it down, so. Eight inches of organic matter comes down to less than an inch after one year, and then even less than that. So you, you have keep to keep doing it. And it's tough with trees because you can't really lift up the trees like mm -hmm. you can flowers and right. add more into it. But yeah, as Doug said, preparation is yeah. key. So wow, there you go, Betty. But I think you might have been right. You, you, it sounds like you do have dirt <laughs> versus <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> versus soil. But try to make mm -hmm. it soil with organic matter. <coughs> wow. Okay, sorry we can't give you the easy way out because there really is a lot of work. Well, moving was easy way well, out. Well, yeah, Doug did mention moving, but I don't think really. <laughs> that may not be practical. That was a may joke. Not. No. Yes. Okay, well, let's go to Sandy's question. She has a lawn question on line five. Hi, Sandy. Hi, thank you for taking my call. You're welcome. Um, we live in an older neighborhood. Our house was built in 1893, and we have a massive backyard. And it's never been completely level, just the nature of the yard. And um, mm -hmm. but in the last few years, we ha it has become extremely uneven. Uh, with the, it's like a heaving up of areas that it's almost dangerous to walk on <laughs> for me. <laughs> and I'm worried about my grandkids, you know, playing out there because you can stub your toe just every other step. Uh, and I didn't know what I could do short of bringing in a dozer and grading it all and starting from scratch. Yeah, I'm interested in hearing the answer. <laughs> maybe the not a grader, but maybe a roller. Yeah. yeah. That's what I was going to suggest, rolling it. And I mean, it could be, I, I'm thinking of earthworms, I'm thinking of moles, and I, I'm thinking mm -hmm. of roots coming up that you talked mm -hmm. about. Right. But, I, I'm, but you got to watch out if you roll it too much, not you can, too much. You can mm -hmm. compact okay. the soil. So. Uh, you can get empty rollers, or you can get a roller that you either fill lightly with water or a little bit of sand. Mm -hmm. That might be one thing to try. And if you didn't want to invest in the roller, you could have someone, you know, a landscape company mm -hmm. or turf company roll for you. I wonder if you could just um, drag a chain link fence with some um, railroad tie, you know, just mm -hmm. start to... Yeah. Get it and and who's know. dragging that? <laughs> you know, those railroad ties aren't that light. A tractor. Oh, a tractor. A tractor gotcha. Would do that. Okay. Or grandkids. Or grandkids. <laughs> or no. football <laughs> team. <laughs> football <laughs> team. Yeah. I was thinking a lawn track. I mean, okay. even a lawnmower yeah. might right. be able to do that. But anyway, try a roller. I think that's probably a good idea. 
Okay, we're going to go back to some emails, and uh, Doug, I want to start with you first. All right, we have an email from one of our viewers, and they're asking about, um, they have this eve when we, when your show ended, they were trying to contact us, and they mentioned that they have an issue with their lawn, and their lawn underneath a tree, which they believe is a linden tree, and I believe it is also based on the images that they sent in, and the grass isn't growing well under... Um, the, the uh, under two of them in particular and they're wondering what to do about that well once again there well they actually have several things to do one is they can actually uh, mulch if they don't mind having wood chips or use the rocks like they have under uh, the one tree with the uh, bricks and if that isn't of your liking you can um, try to reseed you can use a blend and a mix of both fine fescue tall um, a perennial rye and uh, Kentucky bluegrass and it should be able to um, fill in. Of course do some soil amendment, don't just sprinkle the seed on the existing area because I'm imagining that there's probably been a lot of leaf litter and since uh, linden trees are pretty dense and um, stately as far as their pyramidal form uh, it's probably shaded out a lot of um, the growth of the uh, grass in the previous years. Another thing to do is you can explore with uh, different ground covers. You don't have to use turf. You can use uh, liriope. Uh, you can use Japanese spurge. You can mm -hmm. use um, a number of different ones uh, depending on your liking. So um, you can try these three different options, mulching, other perennials or ground covers, mm -hmm. or you can actually uh, reseed. That was a beautiful site too. Mm -hmm. You know, it's really what you want to do, but I think the reseeding, they may have to do it Again, Again, in a few yeah. years, but yeah. it was really, those trees look beautiful. So, very good. Thank you, Doug. And now, Jennifer. Great. I've got a question from a viewer in Chicago, Illinois, and they are looking for some easy perennials to grow in pots on a balcony because everything they plant in pots dies. Mm -hmm. And hard to say from their question whether they're dying just over the growing season or they're dying over the winter. Uh, but one of the questions I get pretty common is uh, wanting to plant things in a pot and having them overwinter in the pot. And one thing you need to remember is that you don't want that pot to freeze. So you need to move that pot into a garage, unheated garage or shed, somewhere where it's not going to freeze solid because that freezing and thawing cycle will destroy the plant. I've had some really good luck overwintering um, different things in my garage that way. Um, but in terms of which perennials to choose, I would stay away from things like Baptisia that have a, a large taproot that are hard to transplant anyway. And putting them in a pot is just going to be uh, destined to fail. Um, anything that ha has a large root system or a very large plant is going to not do well in a pot. It's going to be hard to keep up with watering, especially on a balcony. I would stick to things that are smaller, more compact. And uh, also, I wouldn't spend like buy the fanciest perennials that are out there because you are putting it in a pot. You want to try to t treat those like an annual because you just never know. And a lot of people will be fooled by this winter where it's been a little warmer and think that everything can go in a pot and magically survive. And that's just not, not the case around here. I have some friends, they'll do perennials, but they'll leave one pot that they just put a pot in there mm -hmm. and then they move in and out with bulbs, oh, sure. annuals, herbs, just one of the pots. So they have one thing that's brand new and they recycle it in and out. That's a cool idea. But you know, you still, you still have to put something new in there sure. every so often. But it does kind of spark up your, your pot. Change it up. Then I guess you give those plants away. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> or you have a place to plant them. Okay, thank you. That was kind of a, a fun question. All right, now David. My question is exactly seven words. Help, the rabbits are eating my flowers. <laughs> <coughs> and actually, this was last summer, but rabbits don't really stop for any season of the year. Mm -hmm. So they'll be feeding on plants during spring, summer, fall, and winter. Uh, winter damage, in my opinion, tends to go more toward the trees and shrubs, and it can be really severe. Uh, when they start eating the flowers, it's because they're, they're tasty. They're looking for anything to eat during the wintertime much the same thing as well as grinding down their teeth uh, because their front teeth, I, uh, Phil told me that they kept growing and growing mm -hmm. and if they don't grind them down, they end up uh, hurting themselves. Okay, so what do you do to control rabbits? Um, a good dog that um, we grew up with a collie and we never had 
rabbits in our yard, or at My least. My cat named Andy. <laughs> and cats would be doing the same thing. Fencing is probably the only surefire way, mm -hmm. um, but you gotta make sure that the fence goes down deep into the ground and so they don't dig and tunnel underneath it. There are repellents that you can use. You know, people talk about throwing bags of human hair out there. Um, people talk about uh, wild animal urine as like coyote and wolf urine around the plants. It, it stinks. Your yard stinks yeah. doing that, but you won't have rabbits. Um, uh, <laughs> believe it or not, at hunting stores okay. because hunters will put that on them so the deer don't smell them. So actually, you do go out there mm -hmm. and it, uh, my question was how they collect it. I think that's more of an important question. Uh, then where do you find I'm sorry different Diane. show different show <laughs> anyway there are repellents too out there that don't smell as bad as some of these things um, you might even just want to be able to uh, provide an alternative food source for the deer you know get some carrots get some lettuce things like that out there that doesn't mean they won't go out there after them but um, I'd say the fencing and the dog and the cats may be the best bet but in the yeah. It, within city limits, that may be difficult sometimes. Too. But fencing may have to be. May be the best, surest what it way. Comes of down it. to yep. how far down for the fence? About what, two, three feet? Well, uh, <laughs> hopefully not that, Doug. <laughs> you know, usually they say about six inches, but also bend it in because uh -huh. if they crawl under and they start to dig up, they're going to hit that fence too. Uh -huh. So if you go with some type of fencing, uh, like if you use chicken wire, make sure you have at least some of it buried and at an mm -hmm. L or an angle. So they don't crawl up into the that makes uh, sense. into the into the garden. Okay, that makes good sense. All right, well we're going to try to get in one more turf question on line two. Hi there. Hello. Do you have a question about turf? I have a comment about uh, turf. Okay. Are they recommended for the dog pen? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, I have two Great Danes on zoysia. Oh wow, on <coughs> zoysia. Okay. And you know they use it for football fields and golf courses and it's been perfect for me they won't tear it up and there's no weeds that is good to know well zoysia and bermuda grass are both good warm season grasses but so then you, there's a qualifier right so they're going to be brown a good six months out of the year and really brown but um but if it's a backyard maybe absolutely um, and if you have more of a nicer winters the southern part of the state in the mm -hmm. united states yeah but zoysia and ber did Bermuda you say Bermuda grass? grass? Um, I always I drive by a, a spot that has zoysia grass, and I'm always shocked at the even brownness of it. Um, oh. Starting, oh, I don't know, is it December through? It's like November, November through November, May, I think. Through yeah. April for sure. April for sure, yeah. But if it's a backyard and it does hold up, then that would be worth it. So thank you for your uh, comment. We appreciate that. Let's go to our mag quiz next. Which of these vegetables can be safely planted earliest in the spring? A, garlic, B, okra, C, squash, D, eggplant. A, garlic. Garlic is a hardy plant and can be safely planted in late March. It can also be planted in the fall as early as September. Okay, so let's talk about garlic a little bit. When would you plant it, David? I would plant it in the fall, like you said at the very end. Yes. Um, but I, I and you did. You said wait, wait, wait. wait when I said it. that, wait for it, and it was there. But and in you the plant fall. it in the fall because it'll often be bigger, right, and nicer. I know. Chuck Voigt always talks about it in the fall. Oh, absolutely. Um, so, but, but you, you can, still can do it in the spring. But you can do it in the spring. It just won't be those nice big cloves. So, yes. so that's why there were two. But some of the earliest things to plant, and if they're perennial, you get early things like asparagus, if you've already gotten them planted. What would you plant that's early? I mean, not right now, but maybe March, April. Oh, lettuce or... Radishes, 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 radishes,
a lot, real bumpy, and I also want to spray it for crabgrass. So could you give me just a timeline for that and which to do first? Okay. I'd say the timeline is for the crabgrass preventers is about when the forsythia is blooming, okay. and you may have to repeat it about six weeks later, depending on what the spring is like. Uh, the downside is that if you're going to slit seed, you will probably kill your seeds mm -hmm. with the crabgrass preventers. So you might want to wait until the fall to actually improve it with the grass seed, and then rolling as soon as the ground thaws out would be my recommendation for mm -hmm. that. Which but ties in well with the other person's right. call that we had, too. Yeah, right. So I like the idea of putting your crabgrass preventer on when there's a forsythia. That it just, then you know at all parts of mid-America when to do it. I like Absolutely. that. Okay, my, the show went fast. I want to thank you each for watching. Have a great week gardening or planning your gardening. Bye-bye. <laughs>